Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Pastor Jeff, and unfortunately, I'm not with you in the flesh this morning, and I desperately wanted to be, but as the week progressed, I found out late Saturday night this was not going to be possible, and so uh, early on in the week, just to explain a little bit, my daughter was sick. She had several COVID symptoms. They tested her for strep, and we hoped that was what it was, but that came back negative, so they decided to test her for COVID, and uh, while we still have not received that result yet, we have been quarantining out of caution, trying not to infect anybody with what she may or may not have, and so as as we are still waiting on the results, we decided it best that I not be there in person just in case today. And so I have this message that I want to give to you, though, and it's a message that uh, I'm passionate about. It's a message that I believe is deeply needed and, and biblical, and I, I hope and I pray that you will receive it this morning in the heart that it is intended. Because while this is a message of great hope, this is also a challenging message, and it's challenged me and is challenging me, and I believe that as the week progresses, it will challenge us. And so I want to remind you, and I'll do it at the start, and I'll do it at the end, that today's message is a message of hope. It's a message of hope. It's a message of hope that regardless of who wins the election on Tuesday, it's a message of hope regardless and if you feel defeated or excited on Wednesday, it's a message of hope that no matter what the next four years have in store, whether it's the same leadership or different leadership, this, what I'm going to give you today, is a message of hope. And I'm going to tell you today about two extremely important truths that regardless of what happens during the election, will not change. Two truths that will not change. And these two truths and remembering these two truths is a part of what makes us us as Christians. It's a part of what makes us different from the rest of the world. And so I want to share with you today these two important truths in this message of hope. All right, the first truth. Are you ready? The first truth is this. God is still in control. Write that down, right? God is still in control. No matter what happens Tuesday, take hope, church. Why? Because God is still in control. Uh, the Bible is clear, very clear about this. Who sits on the throne? The Bible tells us. Let's look at a couple places. Number one. Psalms 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens, and He does all that He pleases. Our God is in the heaven. He does all that He pleases. And let's go down a little further to Psalms 22.28. It says, For kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. This is coming from, from King David saying, listen, kingship belongs to the Lord. You may look at me as an earthly king, but let me tell you about the real king. And he, he is the one who rules not just over the nation of Israel, not just over the United States of America, but he rules over all nations. Now, anyone who thinks that they are in control while they're on this earth is, is doing exactly that. They are, they are thinking that they are in control. Uh, I want to take a, a moment with you, if you would. Let's walk through some biblical history. We're going to walk through the this, this story of the Bible and, and, and find these subtle reminders that no matter what happens in the good times or in the bad times, that God is still in control. Okay? So uh, let's think about this. When Pharaoh was exercising authority over the Israelites, enslaving them in bondage for 430 years, God was in control. Now, when Moses led the Israelites out of bondage, God was in control. When the Israelites wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, frustrating as that might have been, God was in control. 
when Israel entered into the promised land, God was in control. When Assyria conquered Israel, God was in control. When, when Mary was rejected at the inn, God was in control. When, when Jesus was healing and performing miracles all over the place, God was in control. When Jesus was crucified, betrayed, hung upon the cross, God was in control. And when Jesus rose on the third day, God was in control. When, when, when Jesus gave this mission to the early church to go and make disciples, God was in control. When the early church, the, their mission was given to them, and they were just, just, just a handful of people given this mission of spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus, God was in control. And when the early church exploded in growth, God was in control. But when the early church was persecuted, and martyrs were made out of many of the leaders and the people of the early church. God was in control. During the mountains, during the valleys, during the good times and the bad times. When things were chaotic and when things were crystal clear. Through all of these times, one thing remained. This truth that God is in control control. Even when it feels like it and when it doesn't feel like it, God is in control. Now, I've heard people use Romans chapter 13 verse 1 as a scripture to help support whatever politician or candidate that they, they like that is in office. And I want to refresh our memories real quick on what that, what that scripture is. It's Romans chapter 13 verse 1. And it says this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, they have been instituted by God. Now, it seems pretty clear there, right? But here's what I want to make even more crystal clear, right? Listen, we can't argue biblically that God is in control and he put so-and-so in office just because we like them and then refuse to believe that God is in control still when somebody is elected that we do not like. God is in control or he's not. And, and that's what I want you to decide today. I want you to think about this. And, and it may be easy for you, but it may be difficult for you. I want you to think right now and I want you to decide, is God in control or is he not in control? God, God's not just in control when he's doing things that you like. He's in control or he's not. Decide now who's in control. And then Wednesday, regardless of the outcome of the election, remind yourself, God is in control. Whoever wins the election is put in place by God for the fulfillment of his good plan. Now, we, we don't know. Who is going to win that election? I have no idea. And we may or may not agree with whatever it seems that God's plan is at the time. But listen, their winning the election does not mean that they are necessarily God's man. But what it simply means is that they are put in place to help fulfill God's plan. How will it play out? For what purposes? How could God possibly use you fill in the blank to fulfill his good plan? Only time will tell. And I don't know the answer, but this is what I do know. And this is what you know. It's what Paul tells us in Romans 8, 38. And we need to remind ourselves of this. He says that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. God is working things out for our good. And I gotta tell you, there's things that have happened in my life. And, and I wonder and I question, God, how could that possibly be for my good? How could you use that travesty, that tragedy, that heartbreak 
How could that be for my good? And I've wondered that. And it's no different with our country, with our life, with our world. When things that happen that we don't understand with our finite minds, we have to remember that we serve a God who is all, is created all, is over all, and he understands things that we simply don't understand. And so he's working out his plan for our good and for his glory, no matter if we understand or if we don't. He's working all things out for the good of those who love him. We may not always see it. Listen, we may not always feel it, but we must choose to believe it. We must choose to trust that the God who created all, who knows all, who is all and is over all, that he is working things out for our good. We got to trust that that God, that God is in control, even when we feel like it or when we don't feel like it. That gives me hope today. There's a lot of things that that don't make me feel hopeful going on in our world right now, but this thought, this idea that no matter what happens, no matter if I understand it or perceive it or don't, that God is in control, that gives me hope. I hope it gives you hope today. I hope that it gives you a feeling of peace today, that no matter what, listen, this truth is true. God is in control. All right, so truth number two. We talked about truth number one. God is in control no matter what happens and how this week plays out or how your life is going right now. Do not forget, church, God is in control. Here's truth number two, that no matter what happens, no matter how life is going, we have to remember this truth. Number two, that the great commandment and the great commission are still our greatest concern. No matter what happens, no matter how life changes, No matter how we feel, the great commandment, the great commission are still our greatest concern. Listen, uh, as the election comes and goes, praise the Lord, right? Uh, The vision for America, it may change or it may not change. But what I know for sure is that the mission of every Christian, it will not change. That our mission remains the same. Listen, the, the future of America is important, but to Christians, it is not now, nor has it ever been, our primary or greatest concern. When you call yourself a follower of Christ, you're saying that our first allegiance, our primary allegiance is to Christ and Christ alone. Before family, before work, before hobbies, and yes, listen, even before country, our primary allegiance, what we pledge allegiance to before anything else as followers of Christ is Jesus Christ alone, the great king who sits on the throne. When you call yourself a follower of Christ, you understand that. That our God is is not just a God who created the United States of America, but he is a God who created the entire world and all of the life that makes it up. Patriotism is, is good, right? But if patriotism slips into first place in our life, if it starts to take rank over Jesus and over the great commandment and the great commission, then it becomes an idol and it's destructive. And so we have to make sure that we keep it in its proper place and that we keep, most importantly, the great commandment and the great commission in our allegiance to Jesus Christ in its proper place. So let's take a look at this a little better. Because when Jesus gave us our marching orders over 2,000 years ago, he gave us what should be our greatest concern. So let's look at the great commandment first. Now let us recap because I fear that too many Christians, myself included sometimes, we get lost and we forget what's really most important. And so let's look and recap real quickly what it is that we need to prioritize number one. Jesus says when he's being asked about What is the greatest commandment? They're trying to trick him. They're trying to trap him. They figure no matter what he says, they can trick and turn around on him that he said something he shouldn't have said. So they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And this is what he replies. Matthew 22, verses 37 through 38. He said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second, it is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he tells us that we must uh, love uh, the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, with strength, with everything that is in us. Our love for God must take the best of us. It must get the most of us because he is ultimate in our life. Our love for him is greater than anyone else or anything else that may come or has come or will come. We love God the most. Jesus makes, us, Jesus makes it clear that if we don't get this right, we're not going to get anything right. This is the first and greatest commandment, that we must love God well. We can't lose sight of our first love. And, and if things aren't going your way in life, then it is quite literally the best time for you to display that your love for God and your love for others is not based on favorable circumstances, but your love for God and for others is steadfast and it won't change regardless of circumstances in your life. And that kind of love is something that the unbelieving world will take notice of when they see that your love is persevering through trials, through afflictions, and through disappointments. That's what the world needs to see in today's Christians, that our love remains steadfast. Then Jesus says the second greatest commandment is what? To love your neighbor as yourself. We got to love God and we have to love others. And if we're loving God first, if we're loving him right, then we're going to be loving our neighbor right too. Because that is the way of God. We'll be loving our neighbor and what we say. We'll be loving our neighbor and, and what we do. We'll be loving our neighbor and what we post. We'll be loving our neighbor and what we share. We'll be loving our neighbor and what we think. We'll be loving our neighbor, right? We'll be doing unto them as we would have them do to us, treating them the way that we want to be treated. That is real love. And so what we see here is that Jesus cares more about loving God in loving our neighbor than he cares about loving anything else in this world. Work, family, hobbies, country. Put it all in a pile because it's nothing compared to God himself. And so we love him. And we need to care about loving him more than anything else in this whole wide world. So not only do the great commandments not change, to love God and to love others. But then there's also the great commission that Jesus gave us. And that also does not change regardless of what happens this week. It's found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It's before Jesus ascends to heaven, meeting with his crew and his posse one more time. And this is what he gives them. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love the way that Jesus starts that out. Did you notice? He says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. He starts that out before he's going to tell them what to do. He's saying, let me tell you why you need to listen to me. Because I am a king, right? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and I rule over all. So listen to me when I say this, because this is important. You're going to need to do this. And if you're a follower of me, you're wanna, going to want to kind of write this down, right? And get this, get this scribbled down so that you know how to do this and always remind yourself of it. And then he says, go, make disciples. Baptize people. Teach them what I've taught you. Be true followers of me. He tells us to go to, to everyone. He says to go to all nations and make disciples, baptize them, and teach them what he's taught us. And that's what we are to be about. And that doesn't change. Regardless of who the president is, regardless of where we live, regardless of how much money we make, regardless of what in the world could change this week, the Great Commission doesn't change. It's still to be our greatest concern. He calls us to make disciples. So 
What does it mean to make disciples? What is a disciple? A disciple is basically a student of Jesus. It's somebody who follows in his footsteps, right? We adhere to his teachings. We want to walk like he walked, to live like he lived, to love others like he loved others. Jonathan Parnell, he broke it down this way as he defined what it meant to be a disciple. He said it's three things, basically. Number one, uh, to be a disciple means that you're to be a worshiper of Jesus, that we, we worship him and we give him worth above all other things. We're a worshiper of Jesus. Number two, it says he said that we're to be a servant of Jesus, that we serve Jesus in all that we do. Yes, we serve in the church. We serve outside of the church. We serve our family. We serve our friends. We serve other people just like Jesus came to serve us. So we're worshipers of Jesus. We're servants of Jesus. And number three, he says, we're, ser- we're a witness of Jesus. We're a witness of of Jesus. That is that, that we not only are to be disciples, but we're to make disciples. That, that we're not only to know what Jesus said, but we're to share what Jesus said, right? We, we know it and we share it. We tell other people about it. We make disciples. We share our love for and our knowledge of God with other people. Every day, as we live it out, we share it. We're witnesses of Jesus. I'm sure that every Christian out there is familiar with these these texts, the Great Commandment, the Great Commission, these texts that I just laid out to you. I'm sure you're familiar with them. You know them. You've heard them. And and maybe you you turned you turned me off a while ago, and you said, you know what? I know what he's going to say. Great Commandment, got it. You know, Great Commission, I get it. But something that that Samuel Johnson said has has stuck with me for a long time. He said this. He said that. People need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed, right? We need to be reminded more than we need to be instructed. Yeah, you could teach me a lot of things because there's a lot of things that I don't know. But you know what? There's a lot of things I do know that I don't put into practice. There's a lot of things I do know that I have heard that I'm not living out. And those things, maybe I need to be reminded of those things more than I even need to learn new things. And I think these are, these are those things that we need to be reminded of. That we need to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we need to love our neighbor as ourselves, And that we need to be concerned with taking the gospel of Jesus Christ into the whole world. That we need to make that a daily concern in our life. If we don't remind ourselves of these matters, of what matters most, if we don't remind ourselves of what should be our greatest concern, then listen, we're going to go about our business and other things are going to take that place. Other things we're going to love the most. Other things are going to become our greatest concern. Other things are going to take the place of Jesus in our life unless we daily remind ourselves that He is what's most important, that He is our greatest love, that loving our neighbors is important, and that sharing the gospel is critical, that these things are to be a part of the Christian life no matter what. Today, I want to remind you of what every Christian should already know. Every Christian should already know these things, but I'm going to remind you of them, okay? Because we need to be reminded more than we need to be instructed, and this is it. Listen, we need to be reminded God is in control, and that the great commandment and the great commission are still our greatest concern. God is in control. Loving God, loving others, making disciples are still our greatest concern. No matter what. Listen, church, today I want you to give you a message of hope. Be of hope because God is in control. And be on mission because the great commandment and the great commission are still our greatest concern. Can I just ask you a few questions today? Questions that I'm asking myself, right? Questions that I myself am wrestling with. Are you a hopeful person? Are you optimistic about what the future holds? Not because of an elected official, but because you understand that God is in control no matter what. Are you hopeful today? I pray that you are. And if you are, I want to hang out with you more because I want to be a more hopeful 
person? How are you doing loving God? I mean, do you feel like uh, God is in His proper place in, in your life? Are you seeking Him as one who truly loves Him? How are you doing loving God in your life? I mean, do you, do you feel like you can say, yes, I love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. And that's a lot of love, and I, I don't feel like I'm there yet, but I'm, I'm going in that direction, and I'm seeking that. But, but are we seeking it? Are we going in that direction? How are you doing loving other people? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? I don't know about you. I, I try to take pretty good care of myself. When I have a need, I, I try to meet my need the best that I can. Are we meeting the needs of others in our community, in our world? Are we meeting the needs of our neighbors that we come across? And what about this? Are, are we making disciples? Are we sharing Jesus? When's the last time that you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time that you engaged somebody in a spiritual conversation that you told them what Jesus did for you even? When's the last time we shared the hope that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to earth, that He lived a perfect life and died on the cross and rose from the dead so that we could be forgiven of our sins, that He paid our penalty, that He, he paid our sin debt. When's the last time we told anybody about that? That's good news, church. Good news. We need to focus on these things. And listen, if we focus on these things this week, I can promise you this, that your week will be more productive and more fruitful than if you focus on anything else. So let's focus on being people of hope. God is in control. Let's focus on loving God, loving our neighbor, and making disciples. And we will have a fruitful and productive week no matter what. I want to close today by just reading one more scripture for you. Passage of scripture found in one, uh, Psalms 146. It's near the end of the book of Psalms, and it's five kind of Psalms that go together there that are kind of this hallelujah, joyful text. And I'm just going to read this out to you, and I just want you to, I'm going to put it on the screen. Just read it, ponder it, and find hope in it, okay? Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul, I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free, and the Lord opens the eyes of the blind the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Listen, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. Our good God is in control. God bless you guys. Let's pray together. And I pray that this message touched your hearts and challenged you as it's challenging me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to remind ourselves daily of these truths. Lord, we thank you that you are in control of our being and our world and our country. Lord, we thank you that you have oversight over all of these things. And Lord, we, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to take our place, to die in our place. And, and Lord, help us in response to have love for you that fills us, 
and overflows out of us into our interactions with other people. And Lord, help us to be on mission for you. God, help us. Lord, we, we pray and we know that your, your will and your good plans will be fulfilled this week. But Lord, help us to trust you no matter what. We love you, God. We thank you for your uh, sovereignty and your authority in this world. We pray in your son's name. Amen. God bless you guys.